Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Data Science Hangout. If we haven't met yet, I'm Rachel. I lead customer marketing at Posit. I'm excited to have you joining us today. The Hangout is our open space to hear what's going on in the world of data across all different industries, chat about data science leadership, and connect with others facing similar things as you. And we get together here every Thursday, every single Thursday, unless it's a holiday, <laughs> at the same time, same place. So if you're watching this as a recording and you want to join us in the future live, there'll be details to add it to your calendar below. Uh, just make sure it adds it for 12 Eastern time, 12 to 1 Eastern time, so you can join live. Um, if this is anybody's first data science hangout, I'd love to see you say hi in the chat so we can all welcome you in and say hello as well. We're all dedicated to keeping this a friendly and welcoming space for everyone and love hearing from you, no matter your years of experience, the languages that you use, titles, industry. It's also totally, totally okay for you if you just want to listen in here um, and be part of the party that's happening in the Zoom chat. But if you want to jump in and ask your own questions or provide your own perspective on certain topics, you can raise your hand on Zoom um, and I'll call on you to jump in. You can put questions in the Zoom chat and feel free to put a little star next to it if you want me to read it or I can call on you to introduce yourself and add some context. We also have a Slido link, which I'm sure Curtis or KJ will share here in the chat, where you can ask questions anonymously too. Um, I love getting to use this time with everybody here to share a few other notes of upcoming <laughs> events too. So just real quick, um, in the Hangouts, we've had a number of questions on best practices for management and stewardship of data. And so I wanted to let you all know that we are having a special event in May on this topic with two previous featured leaders. So Jamie at Plymouth Rock Assurance and Dan at Biogen. And so I'll share this event registration link in the chat here. If you wanna check that out, uh, that's gonna be on May 15th. So I just wanted to give some people some advance notice. And then I also host a monthly data science workflow event. Uh, it's the last Wednesday of every month. And so this month, Julia Silge from our team is gonna be joining us to share how to develop and deploy a machine learning model with Posit Team. And so if you wanna check out those monthly workflows, I'll just put the add to calendar link there too. Cool. Veronica, I know you had something you wanted to share with people before we get started as well. I wanna jump in. Hi, everyone. I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Veronica, Veronica Clark, and I'm actually new to Posit. This is my one month anniversary, but the great news I want to share, I'm actually um, a principal UX designer, and um, I want to leave it open if anybody ever wants to reach out and show me your workflow and how you're using Posit and areas of improvement. I am here for all of that, and um, it's very easy to reach out to me as just Veronica at posit.co. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully we'll run into each other um, as I continue learning and working with these products and um, and improving them for, for y'all to use. So just want to introduce myself. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Well, thank you all again for joining us today. I am so excited to be joined by my co-host for the day, Leanne Dow, Director of Data Science at Rome Therapeutics. And Leanne, I, I'd love to have you kick us off by just introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about your role, but also something you like to do outside of work too. Sure. Um, so my name is Leanne. Um, I'm at Rome Therapeutics. Um, and I started here in my current role about seven or eight months ago. Um, so I'm still relatively new. So Rome Therapeutics is a, a small biotech company based in Boston. And what we are studying is what we call, uh, well, what some people call the dark genome. So, you know, if you think about the human genome, we're all pretty familiar now with the genes that code proteins and have functions that are, you know, relatively well studied. Um, there has been, I think, an increasing appreciation for things that are not protein coding genes. 
Um, and I think that this is an area of study which is it's it's challenging from uh, like a computational perspective. You know, how do you quantify these kinds of uh, elements which have special challenges which we can talk about? Um, and then on top of that, how do you you know relate that to potential new therapies? And so I think it's a really exciting space. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more. My background is going all the way back to uh, college, I guess. Uh, I studied mathematics and uh, I think I, I think I minored in Chinese language. So I spent some time in China. Um, you know, just I think I spent an entire semester just taking language and literature classes, which was really fun and totally different. Um, I think that was my final semester in my senior year. So that was very exciting. Um, but before that, it was really just math all the time. <laughs> and um, the idea that I had had when I was in college was to just pursue math. And um, I was really not interested in biology to the chagrin of my mother who wanted me to be uh, to become a doctor and, and study pre-med and go that track you know, all the way to the end. Um, I did try for, I think, uh, a semester or a year. And I thought that biology was just, it was just a hot mess. No one knew what was going on. Um, and it was just very, it was not very satisfying compared to the kinds of problems that um, I was trying to solve in my math classes, which were um, clean and well-defined and you can, you know, write a proof and it was either true or it wasn't true, right? Um, in biology, you don't have those kinds of, uh, it's it's not very binary. Um, and so I, you know, I really was very set on this all the way through to basically my senior year. And then in my senior year, I had to think about what to do next. And uh, I wasn't ready to get a job. So I thought, well, I have to go to grad school then because I, I have no other skills. <laughs> um, so I was applying to, to graduate school and I applied to a bunch of math programs. But then I also ended up applying to some bioinformatics programs, even though that wasn't something I had really studied before. Um, it was something that I sort of became interested in in some of these uh, summer undergraduate research programs. So I was a math major, but then I tried, you know, for a month or two to study a little bit of genomics. And with genomics, I thought that was something that was cleaner than biology, um, but was still applicable in the real world. And so that was, um, you know, it kind of piqued my interest. Um, and it, it felt like it was the best of both worlds because Towards the end of my undergraduate career, I was beginning to think that pure mathematics, which is what I was studying, it wasn't applied math, it was pure math, um, was becoming less satisfying because I just couldn't see how what I was studying day to day had had any uh, impact on, you know, what I saw day to day, you know, the lives that we were living. So that became less interesting to me. Um, so I applied to a couple of bioinformatics programs and, you know, I, I got into a few of them and I decided just to, to make the jump. You know, I, I had no idea really what I was getting myself into, but I was ready to pull the trigger. So I just went. Um, and that's really how I ended up in computational biology slash bioinformatics. Um, so it's, it's kind of a long winded story of how I got here but I'm really happy to be here. I think it really makes use of, um, you know, some of my skill set from my math background, but also, you know, I've come to appreciate more and more that even though biology, I, I guess it's more that I appreciate the complexity of biology now more than I did before. I think before I was really turned off by it and kind of scared um, and I didn't know how to interpret anything. But I think over the years, I think that kind that unknowingness has become more exciting rather than uh, scary. Thank you so much for that intro into into your journey. What about something that you like to do outside of work too? Yeah, that has really changed a lot over the years. Um, you know, now I I have two little kids. Um, they're both in daycare, so they're not school-aged yet. 
Um, and I spend most of my day sitting in front of a computer, you know, doing this. <laughs> so what I like to do outside of work is really to get outside, uh, to get moving. So I run, I've been running for um, maybe like 20 plus years now. Um, it's really, I'm not fast. I don't run to to race. I run to be outside. I run to, for the feeling of running. Um, you know, I, I think... One of my best graduate school friends was also a, a big runner. And I think that she put it really well when she described why she enjoyed running. You know, she really treated it almost as a like a meditation activity. We used to go for these long runs and uh, you just get all of the stuff that you were thinking about that was percolating in your head, you know, all day or all night. You get it out um, and you get the endorphins instead. And it really helps to clear my mind, especially when I'm like really stuck on a problem and I'm feeling yeah. really frustrated. Um, it really helps. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to see what are the common hobbies among this group, because it's yeah. running is definitely one of them. And then playing music is definitely. Yeah, yeah. I played uh, piano for many, many years, but I, I started drifting away from piano when I started doing more computer work, because after the end of a long day, I don't want to sit again <laughs> in front of something uh, I want to be moving around yeah well I was I was wondering you mentioned a bit about the dark genome but for mm -hmm. some of us without a biology background would you be able to explain a little bit more about the dark genome and about the the work you're doing at Rome mm -hmm. yeah so I think you know, probably everyone has learned in school this central dogma of you know we have our DNA it encodes, uh, you know, genes which get um, transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA gets turned into protein, and that the protein is the stuff that does stuff in our body. Um, and I think that that has been the dogma for many, many years. Um, but the the percentage of our genome that encodes these protein coding genes is actually really small. So most of our DNA uh, is not coding for that. And I think that we're, you know, we're, we're still sort of learning what else is there. So these non-protein coding genes, I think for a long time have been described as, you know, junk DNA, um, but we called it junk because we didn't know what it was doing. And so at Rome, you know, we're very specifically focused on this class of elements called um, repetitive elements. So, you know, we have like one copy of gene A, maybe two copies of gene B, but then there are these elements where we have like hundreds of thousands of copies of basically the same element. Um, it's like a gene, it may or may not encode protein. Um, and some of these elements have the ability to lift themselves up and make new copies in our genome. It's very cool, um, but we don't really, understand like the full implications of what they're doing. And so we think, you know, especially in the last, I don't know, maybe five or 10, 10 years, um, people have been starting to appreciate that they're playing a role in potentially cancer, in autoimmune disease, in inflammation. And so at Rome, we're, you know, thinking about these elements and not only what roles they play, but you know, in which human diseases could they be causal or maybe a biomarker of disease and where we can potentially impact um, human health for the better. Is that helpful? Yeah, that is helpful. I know, um, Bill, you had, a, a, I think, a follow-up question here on dark genomics. Bill, do you want to jump in or you want me to read it? I can read it. Um, but it, the question was with dark genomics, are you using the same widely used suppliers of sequencing machines or are you developing new software related to new hardware? Yeah, so the, the sequencing technology itself, um, we're primarily using the same sequencing technology. So, you know, there's short read sequencing and long read sequencing. There are kinds of pros and cons of both for looking at these repetitive elements. Um, I think the challenge is, I mean, in part the, the technology, but really what we are focused on is downstream of that in the quantification algorithms. 
um, and the algorithms to detect where new elements are being inserted, which weren't there previously. So a lot of this is algorithmic development. And, um, you know, I, I didn't build any of these algorithms. These were here when I joined. Um, but we have some really, really excellent computational scientists who have been at Rome for, you know, a couple of years now who have really built up this platform. Thank you. Travis, I see you just put a question in the chat. Want to jump in next? Sure. Um, hey, it, it's cool to, to meet you. Um, I spent some time thinking about long non-coding RNAs and prostate cancer in a very academic mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've, I've moved over to kind of CRO world, um, much like where, where you operate um, at Rome. I'm curious about your business pipeline and like the research pipeline. Um, so what proportion of it there happens by virtue of kind of computational discovery only? And then where does that data come from? Like, so in the, in the academic setting, it was a lot of kind of epidemiological studies and mm -hmm. specimens collected. We do deep sequencing, and then we kind of try to infer through ML and other techniques what kinds of targets in the dark genome might be relevant. Um, but mm -hmm. you all have a different kind of pipeline. You do a lot of mice studies. Is there other in, kind of in vitro work that you do? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it depends on... I guess how far along the asset is, you know, so we have, you know, assets that are approaching the clinic very soon. And then we have assets that are like early, early development, right? And so depending on where we are in terms of how far along clinically, um, it, I think it, it changes, you know, what kind of research we do. So for our lead program, RPT 2950, we're going after autoimmune disease and specifically uh, cutaneous lupus. And so, you know, a lot of research has already been done there. And we've done, like, for example, a lot of in vivo and in vitro studies and some ex vivo studies, which are really interesting, where um, you actually, so this is, they're like a CRO that does this, where they take these skin samples, which have been excised from patients undergoing like cosmetic surgery. And then they can, you know, grow, not necessarily grow, but like keep them alive in a, in a dish. And you can treat them with different things um, with like uh, with UV or your compounds or whatever. And then you can sort of see what changes in terms of their gene expression. You can even profile um, like with imaging technology, like how the skin changes um, over that period of time is really cool. For like early discovery things, when we're looking for new indications and new targets, that's where I think you have to do, you have to kind of take a step back because you don't know exactly what you're looking for there, right? And so I think that in part is driven by computational discovery. So we've processed, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many, like tens of thousands of samples, maybe a hundred thousand samples at this point. Um, of public data all across different kinds of indications, all across your, um, you know, your your gold standard data sets like TCGA, GTEx, you know, those kinds of data sets, um, and a, a bunch of different indications um, from studies in public databases like GEO. And then there we look for, you know, any indication of activity of the targets that we're interested in and also genes which are related to activity. That's cool. So in your team, uh, mm -hmm. do you have like a small army of people who are just cranking on TCGA, GTEx, and Geo like all day long? It sounds like oh, the academic yeah. dream, you know? <laughs> we need a bigger, we need a bigger army. <laughs> the army's never big enough. Um, but, but yes, more or less, um, you know, that's, I think that's one of the, the fun slash frustrating parts of being in a small company. Like Rome is small. Um, I think in total now we have like 30, 30 something people. And the computational group is me and three scientists. Um, and so you can imagine the amount of work that it takes to develop and then maintain the pipeline and then do the analysis and then like continually trying to improve that pipeline. It's a lot of work and we get stretched pretty thin. Um, so prioritization is, is really important and your priorities are going to change um, from day to day. Cool. Thanks. And not oh, to jeopardize all the, but then the, the skin, the skin, uh -huh. uh, what xenographs, I guess you call them maybe like, what do you do? Do you, do you like give them sunburns and stuff? I, yeah, <laughs> I, you, you do. do yeah. yeah. I once, yeah. I once had a colleague who had like a whole basement full of, um, I mean, it's not a basement. It was like a research lab full of mini brains. He called that them. It was very X-Files. 
yeah, yeah. And they always, <laughs> and then you always wonder, like, are there, are, are, do they have consciousness? They're like living in these little petri dishes, brains. It's like kind of weird. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Now, I had not heard about this kind of assay until um, it was run, and we were analyzing the results uh, just maybe a couple months ago. I know you you actually just talked a bit about prioritizing, and that was actually a question I wanted to ask you here. So at a, a company with 30-something people, how do you prioritize projects and allocate resources? It's a really good question. Um, and the answer should not be haphazardly. Um, you know, I think that you really need to have a, a high level understanding of what the timelines are for the company and what's driving those timelines, right? So you have to kind of take a, a top-down approach. And okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna diverge a little bit and tell an anecdote. Um, both of my parents are university professors, and so my dad teaches uh, mathematics, so pure math, and my mom is a professor of statistics. And I remember when I was describing, you know, my day to day because they've only been in the academic world, and they were like, you know, what do you what do you do every day? And I'm like, well, I sit in like five or six hours of meetings every day, and they're like. What do you, why do you need to sit in so many meetings? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I think a lot of it is just, you know, getting everyone and all the teams, like these very disparate teams doing very disparate activities on the same page um, because you have to drive forward these programs um, where you need biology to run biology experiments. You need computational um, folks like myself to run computational experiments. You need chemistry to make the chemical matter. Um, and trying to get everyone on the same page to agree on what is the best path forward, what is, you know, what are the go, no-go decisions, and what are the timelines um, in terms of, yeah, so what are the timelines and how long can your company survive for, you know, especially as a small company, uh, that, that part is really important. So that takes a lot of effort. Um, you don't necessarily have to think about that in an academic setting as much. So even though my dad was the chair of the math department for many years, um, he had to deal with, you know, some of this, what they call politicking, right? Um, getting everyone on the same page. But it's like Professor A and Professor B are working on two completely different things. They don't have to, you know, get together and talk about what are you doing today? What are you doing today? What are you doing next week? Um, they don't have to align on those kinds of things. Um, and it turns out that alignment takes a lot of time. Definitely. Um, Nellie, I see you had a question in the chat here. Want to jump in? Sure. Um, thanks, Leanne, uh, for sharing uh, about your journey. Uh, I studied biology in undergrad, um, mm -hmm. as well as economics. Uh, and now I've been working in finance in a data science role for a few years, about five years. Um, something I've always thought about was uh, transitioning back over to the intersection of data science and biology. Um, mm -hmm. But I do know there's definitely um, a lot of uh, need for higher degrees. Um, and I was curious what you thought, um, you know, are certain things that individuals should take into account if they're interested in moving over to the sciences mm -hmm. um, and away from a traditional data science role? Mm -hmm. Traditional finance, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know much about finance, um, but I do know that people, at least early on, you know, when I was in grad school, people made this change between going the finance route and going the bioinformatics route, they made it pretty fluidly at the time. Um, I think that that's probably different after you've been in the workforce for a little bit. So it sounds like you've been in the workforce maybe for a couple of years now. Um, so I think after that, it becomes a little bit more challenging, but it's not impossible. Um, especially if you're willing to start in like an entry level role, um, I think that's entirely possible. And I think that, and I'm biased here, but, you know, one of the things that I love about working in startups is that, well, okay, I, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong, the wrong thing. Um, but I think that one of the benefits of working in a startup is that you can start a role and not have like very, very deep um, and 
uh, mm -hmm. narrow knowledge in a particular role. I think what you typically need to be able to do in a startup environment is to play many different roles and start up very quickly. So I'll give a, a, a little bit of an example from my own um, experience, which is not quite what you're, you know, what you're talking about, but I think it has some relation. So in my first industry job, I was at a place called Series Therapeutics, and we were very, very, I mean, we were a microbiome um, therapeutics company. And so I worked there for uh, almost six years. And when I was there, everything was about microbial profiling. And, you know, we were like processing stool samples. We were thinking about what is the best algorithm? What is the best database for determining what kinds of bacteria are in a sample? Um, nothing like human data related at all, basically. Um, and towards the end of that, I was thinking, you know, I wanted to broaden my experience a bit to, you know, working in like to learn more about oncology, um, to broaden outside of the microbiome space. And, you know, I, it's not like I could jump directly into, uh, you know, like a principal scientist or senior director of oncology at one of these small startup companies, right? Because I didn't have the experience. Um, so I ended up going to a small company that didn't have a bioinformatics function at all. And so I got to, you know, A, learn how to build up that bioinformatics infrastructure, spin it up in the cloud. But B, at the same time, I had a mentor who basically took a chance on me um, and gave me a little bit of time to sort of ramp up on oncology. You know, how do people think about, on, you know, problems in oncology? Um, specifically, I was in this space called um, the antibody uh, drug conjugates. So that was completely out of my wheelhouse at the time. Um, but it's not something that you that you can't learn, right? So I think, you know, what's really important is to understand your own capacity for learning new things. Um, and I think that if you're confident that you have that capacity, that you can do it. It's just how much effort is it going to take? Um, and are you willing to commit that effort? But I'm a strong believer in that, especially in startup spaces, because, you know, one day this company is going to be here and one day it's not. You're going to have to go somewhere else and probably pick up new skills while you're at it. I know that that's probably not like super helpful, but I think it's possible is my answer. Um, it, it's just about finding, um, you know, the time to, to do some training on your own, but also finding the right fit in terms of a new job, um, you know, in the space that you're interested in going into. That's great. Thank you so much. And I, I think also once you know yourself that you have that capacity to learn, how do you then show the hiring manager at this other role that you, you do mm -hmm. have and then that's the benefit? Yeah. A lot of it is trying to draw parallels. So maybe you don't have a specific skill. You haven't done this particular analysis before, but in data science, you know, one of the great things is that if you're working with data, you just have to know what kind of data it is in order to know how to treat it and how to do the analysis, right? So maybe I haven't, you know, done an analysis with uh, human gene expression before, but I've done a lot of bacterial, you know, um, composition analysis. So you can draw those kinds of parallels. Um, and I think it's easier to do that in the data science space than in some other spaces. Definitely. Thank you. Um, Svetlana, I see you had a question a little bit earlier. Want to jump in here next? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, uh, my question was about like computational biology and bioinformatics versus uh, data science. So mm -hmm. my background is like uh, actually a bit similar to yours. I did uh, had like uh, computational biology slash bioinformatics uh, degree uh, and then a little bit of postdoc experience and then I transitioned to data science mm -hmm. but I feel like that it's for me it's always kind of, so um, I'm not doing bioinformatics anymore because I feel like I probably don't want to or maybe I was a bit too traumatized with like the academia experience and like working in the lab and like all of this 
uh, but I sometimes think of going back. But um, I'm curious because I was also like uh, was looking at your profile, right? So right now you're uh, director of data science, right? But so do you feel that this role is different or is it uh, because like you have data science in your title uh, or it is still more like computational biology, but just named as a data science? Definitely the latter. This is, is a trend in the industry that I really only noticed in the last couple of years. Um, you know, five, six, seven years ago when I was getting started, everything was comp bio, bioinformatics. And then in the last couple of years, I started seeing everyone's title started shifting towards being data science. Um, I don't know what was driving that trend. I still consider what I do computational biology. Um, you know, maybe people want to say data science because it, it seems to have more like broader implications. So we do more than just, you know, genomic pipelines, for example, like we analyze all kinds of data. So in that sense, okay, you know, data science, that's fine. Um, but I, it's definitely still the same thing. Yeah, interesting. But so uh, would you say that, so at your company, for example, yeah, there is no other data science, right? Like no, there isn't. The kind of separation that I've seen, which is more typical, I think is within, is like between computational biology and then bioinformatics um, slash bioinformatics engineering, right? So, you know, for, so this was the case at, um, when I was at Ceres, we had a computational biology group, which is more focused on translational analysis. Um, and then there's the bioinformatics group, which is more focused on building the infrastructure and the algorithms. So I started out in the bioinformatics department there and sort of slowly transitioned over to the computational biology group. Um, that is more of the distinction that I've seen in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Yen. Yen, you asked a question. There's a little asterisk, so I'll read it. Um, but it was, how do you keep up with the technology and knowledge in the fast developing area? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. So if, so first of all, you know, in a lot of companies, we have um, resources that go out and find patents and IP and interesting, what appears to be, you know, interesting um, related publications uh, every week or every month. And we get that kind of report. Um, but also what has been really helpful, especially when you're in like a new field, is to just set up a ton of Google Scholar alerts. So I have Google Scholar alerts for all sorts of things. And then every, you know, <laughs> It should be every day, so it's not every day. Um, so it does pile up over time. I, th I think I have like 90 unread ones right now, but I try, right? I try to get through the pile um, every couple of weeks or so. Um, and so you can, that way you can really keep on top of like cutting edge, what is being published, what are people saying? Um, it's like the biology side, the clinical side and the technology side. I think that that is uh, actually really helpful and uh, low lift, except for when you're, you know, trying to go through your inbox. Yeah, I think I think that actually ties into something you and I had chatted about a little bit before, but you said in order to be the best data scientist you can be, you have to know the right questions to ask in that space and other ways that you kind of went about that when you first started in your role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is an area of, growth that most people go through, um, you know, as they become more senior in their roles. So, you know, when you are fresh out of grad school, I think most of the people who, you know, when you first graduate, you have a lot of really uh, sharp technical skills. And so you really just need someone to tell you, you know, solve this problem. Tell me, you know, very basic question, uh, what are the differentially expressed genes? What are the pathways that are differentially expressed? Um, and everyone can do that, right? Um, if, if you're coming from a bioinformatics background. I think as you progress and you start, you know, or in my case, moving away from just the bioinformatics and going into computational biology, into the translational questions, at some point, someone, like there isn't going to be someone 
to tell you what are the questions to ask, right? And at that point, you, you either, you know, need to find someone who can do that for you, or you need to start thinking of those questions yourself. I think that part can be pretty challenging um, because you have to understand not just what your tool set is able to answer, um, but what are the data that are available? You know, what are the relevant biological questions um, in a particular indication or in a particular space um, that's relevant for your company to help drive the science forward? And that, I think that takes, you know, it can take a while to learn to pick up. But I think that's where people who have the biology background, you know, people who come into bioinformatics have all different kinds of backgrounds, right? So some people come in from a math background like myself, some people come in from a physics or a chemistry background, and some people, I've known actually several people who come from like an ecology or a, a biology background. And so they actually, I think, have the benefit of having already been trained to ask those kinds of specific questions, um, which, you know, for someone like myself, who really avoided a lot of biology classes growing up, um, you know, I, I had to sort of learn that uh, on the fly. Thank you. Kevin, I see you have a question in the chat. Want to ask that one next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was, my question is, is kind of related to what you were talking about a few minutes ago about you know, being the, the data science director or, you know, having a title of data scientist. Um, when you're really doing computational biology work. Um, but yeah, I was just curious, you know, since it is a small company, um, do you end up getting pulled into or, or seeing opportunities for efficiencies in terms of like business informatics or, you know, there's, there's I find as, as someone, you know, who's doing more scientific work, but having a data science background, a bunch of, around a bunch of people who aren't data scientists, a lot of times I'll, I'll be interested in, oh, I could solve this, administrative problem that people are facing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that I think is a, is a good idea. Um, I'm just curious, yeah, if, if you end up getting getting pulled in that direction, and how you feel about that, if that's something you enjoy or something you feel is a distraction. I will say that I probably have not had that many opportunities to do that because we've had so like so much activity going on um, in the data science group that we just haven't had the bandwidth to look into that. Um, you know, there, there are some examples where, but it's all like related to data science, like in terms of, um, you know, uh, cleaning up our, our data science workspace, like our Google Cloud workspace and working with a chemistry group and trying to, you know, streamline things in terms of where we run our computes and how do we spend this money? That's something which is kind of an administrative task that we do get pulled into, but that's, again, still data science related, right? Um, I guess the, the one example that happened kind of recently is, you know, sometimes we get, we are asked to summarize a bunch of like conference proceedings. And so, you know, I had at one point at my previous company, I was the only data person there and they had sent a couple of people to different uh, conferences and they had brought back all of these proceedings or presentations in PDF format. And the, they were like, well, we want to summarize all of these things. So there were a lot of documents and like hundreds of conference proceedings. And, you know, uh, a friend of mine who is a scientist was complaining to me. She was like, well, I have to read through all of these presentations and provide a summary. And I was like, well, I could probably help you a bit with that. And so, you know, we can pull the text out of the PDF and then summarize it with like one of these LLMs. So that, you know, is like a very small use case. Um, but when we have time and, and there's a need, that's something that we can definitely step in to do. And do, you, and do you think in the future you'll get, I don't know, you know, you could, you could imagine doing predictive modeling for all sorts of kind of business aspects of, of the company, mm -hmm. right? And that you mm -hmm. might be the person with the skills most closely aligned with those goals, even though that's not really what your primary mm -hmm. job is. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you kind of anticipate being pulled into or maybe not? This just hasn't come up yet, I guess. It hasn't come up yet. I know that, you know, there are, so for example, a lot of analyses go into 
trying to find what is the next right indication to go into among um, like a, a choice list, right? So let's say you have these 10 different cancers and you think that your drug could work in all of them, but what is the right market to go into? And so, you know, I've seen um, our BD folks work on those kinds of analyses. It's, but that seems to me like it's very manual at the moment still, right? So you have to do the analysis in terms of, you know, what is the, the patient population? To begin with and then what are the the standard of care lines of therapies and then after you whittle all of that down you say well this is the patient population that we would be able to target after you account for all of these things and then trying to figure out you know what is the the right market in terms of the size of the patient like the treatable patient population um, that you go into but I've only seen the output of those kinds of analyses I haven't seen what goes into it and sort of where they pull those data from but it sounds to me like that's probably very manual, like a manual search kind of thing. You mean like like it has to be manual or it just is that, currently that's manual? What it has been. Yeah, it has been. Yeah. Manual. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I see Bill asked the, it was a follow up question when we were talking about algorithms. And Bill had asked, what role does R and Python play in your workflow? Um, it, we're all Python here. Um, I was all R for many, many years. Um, I think it really depends on the kind of analysis that you're doing. So uh, my personal preference is, you know, when we're writing pipelines and doing data processing, that's all done in Python. Um, I'm really familiar with R in terms of the data analysis side and making figures and reports and things. So I really love Posit for that. Um, you've been using it for a very long time. Um, but that it's it's our day-to-day, -day, right? Every day we open up notebooks and do these kinds of analyses, whether in Jupyter or, or R. Thank you. Um, Jazz, I want to make sure your question, it may have been answered in another one, but if not, I want to Make sure you have an opportunity to jump in. I think it was about roles to suggest for someone with, let me, let me, and you can jump in if you want to add more context, but it was what roles can someone suggest for a life science business analyst with a math and biomedical science degree to make a transition into bioinformatics? Oh, to transition into bioinformatics. Hmm. Jazz, I see you've unmuted. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, so I, I have 10 years of experience in healthcare analytics. So it has been somewhat business analytics, but it's also been healthcare information. Mm -hmm. But I see bioinformatics more towards the science side of things. So, you know, making use of, say, biomedical science knowledge. But I haven't really been doing that. So I just wondered how how easy would it be for someone to jump away from business analytics into more bioinformatics and what kind of roles because I think I mean it's easy to sort of just put in you know bioinformatics analyst but I find that they require MSc um, so are there any other roles that I could make that transition for? yeah I mean I, I think it really depends on your like your current skill set and where you could jump in and sort of uh, start start working essentially um, from from day one. So you know if you are already familiar with you know R or Python to run some analyses, you know it de it doesn't really matter what kind of data are coming in, right? As long as you understand sort of what the distribution looks like, you know what does the data represent. Those are all things that you can learn. Um, I think it's really making the case for whatever role you're looking into. I would assume if you don't have like a master's, you're probably looking at a, a starting as a research associate level um, to make the case that you would be able to pick up these skills given what you're already, like what you have already been able to do. Um, you know, I think that you probably have a better chance 
Well, it's actually hard to say. You know, I want to say that you probably have a better chance at a smaller company, but it really depends on the company and what they're looking for in a role. Um, you know, I think in a larger company, maybe you have a little bit more leeway in terms of, you know, having like having the opportunity to learn skills, like a little bit more time to learn skills on the job, whereas smaller companies want you to really be able to hit the ground running on day one. Um, but I think that probably also varies by company and role. So it's really like trying to find the right match, like the the right role for you, um, given your background, what you want and what the company needs. Yeah, yeah thank you. That answers the question. Uh, well, thank you. I know uh, we've had a few different career type questions here, so I want to make sure I ask this as well. Is there a specific piece of career advice that you've either given to other people or that you've received that stands out in your mind? Advice. Yeah, I mean, so I think personally speaking, um, the most important thing to me is to not be afraid to make the leap into something new. Every time I started, I have started a new job, I have been terrified that it's not going to work out or I'm not going to have the skills. Um, this happened when I was going to grad school. It happened when I moved to my postdoc. It happened when I was, you know, looking for my new job and my second job and my third job every single time. Um, I think this is where it's really important to, to know for yourself internally what you think you're capable of, of doing, right? So yes, you have to convince someone else to hire you that you're capable of doing what you say, but you also have to know that. And so I think once you are comfortable with that, it makes it, you know, then you you don't fear as much the unknown of what the new job is going to look like. It's more that you know that it's going to be, you know, challenging for a couple of weeks or a couple of months as you start up, but that you're going to get there and, and it's going to be fine. Um, yeah, I think fear is natural. Um, being nervous is natural, but I think that, you know, people can, are able to overcome that. I love that. Thank you very much. Um, something that you said to me also, which was like sticking with me as a, a boss said to you before, like, in an ideal world, what would you have accomplished five years from now in an interview? And I thought that was, it's just, I've just been thinking a lot about it too. Um, so I was wondering if you could share that story with everybody. Yeah. Um, so I was, so this was for my very first job. I'd never had a like a job job before. So I was a postdoc. I was interviewing. I was really excited for this opportunity because in my postdoc, I had been studying the microbiome. And then I had this opportunity through a recruiter to work at a microbiome therapeutics company. Um, I knew zero about drug discovery. I knew nothing. Um, so, you know, the the my hiring manager who later became my boss, she asked me like the last question um, before the end of the interviews. She was like, well, in an ideal world, you know, what would you like to have accomplished five years from now? And I like, I really hate that question because like, you know, what do you, what do you know? What, what's life going to look like in five years? Nobody knows. Um, so I was thinking to myself, I was like, well, you know, what, it, what, it, what would be really cool is if I could be part of the team that brought the first like microbiome therapeutic to the market. I had no idea how unlikely um, of, a, of, a, of a goal that could be. Um, I didn't know what timelines look like in drug discovery. Um, and, you know, five years is not a, not a very long time. And we were working on a, a novel therapeutic in a novel space, nothing like no microbiome therapeutic had been approved before. Um, but I, you know, what I like about this story is it kind of showcases, you know, when you are new to an industry and you don't necessarily know what to expect, that you can kind of aim for anything. <laughs> And, you know, not be held back by your preconceived notions of what's possible. 
Um, and it, as it turned out, like five years later, after being at that company, five and a half years later, we were actually on track to, um, to FDA approval for that therapeutic. It's really amazing. It's like kind of an incredible Cinderella story, which I love to tell because Actually, I'm going to add a little bit to that uh, to that story, which is when I started that job, um, I started on Monday and on the Friday of my first week and my first job ever, we got this really, really terrible news that our phase two trial had completely flopped. This is for the same program. Um, and you can you like the the disappointment um, and the heartbreak was really palpable in the room. Right. Everybody had worked so hard on this program and the results were so bad. There was like nothing. There's no signal at all. Um, and I thought I was like going to not have a job on Monday, basically. Um, but somehow, really, I think attesting to scientific leadership, you know, everyone really, really dug down deep. And uh, I was fortunate to be a part of this effort. Um, we went back, looked at the data, reanalyzed the data, built new algorithms, you know, built new software, got new data to, to really figure out what happened to identify all of the issues that led to that uh, failed phase two trial. And we didn't, when we went back to the FDA, we didn't have to rerun the phase two trial. We justified like what we, you know, what we had found and what, why we thought we saw what we did in the phase two, and we were able to proceed to a phase three trial. It was really an amazing story. I love that story. Thank you. Um, I know we have a few minutes left here. I want to make sure I get to all the questions. Matthew, I see your hands raised. Want to jump in? You might be muted still. Oh. Okay. I'll jump over to another one, but I see your hand still up. So if you unmute, feel free to, to go next. Um, Let's see. Oh, Nathan had a, a question just about the microbiome therapy mm -hmm. um, and just more details on that, if that was the same as fecal transplant. Different. It's yeah. actually an oral pill. So FMT, this fecal microbiota uh, transplantation, this is something that has existed for, for several years, for a long time, um, for the treatment of recurrent C. diff. Um, this was a procedure that was not regulated by the FDA, but it it is like very um, efficacious for the treatment of C. diff infections. So what Ceres was trying to do was to make this kind of a regulated, a clean, clean process, because an FMT is really just a, like a fecal enema, which nobody really wants to have done. <laughs> Um, and so what Ceres was developing was this pill, which was derived, which is derived from um, healthy patient stool samples that has been heavily, heavily processed so that all that remains are these bacterial spores from commensal bacteria. And so I've actually seen those pills. They're like, you know, just like a normal pill, little blue pill. Um, and it's just packed full of healthy bacterial spores. And as, as you know, one of the scientists who got to analyze the clinical data, what you see is when patients um, take this pill, they start out with a very dysbiotic uh, microbiome because this is these are patients who are really sick. They've taken lots of antibiotics. Those antibiotics have really destroyed their gut microbiome. There's nothing there. Um, and within like two to three days of taking um, this pill, the microbiome is just like, it's blossoming back. It's really, it's really incredible to see the kinetics. Thank you. Um, Saul, I see you had a question um, in the chat just a few minutes ago. Want to jump in next? And it was on LLMs or generally. Yeah, can you guys, oh, yeah. sorry, Rachel. Oh, no yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, Liang, that you mentioned, like, the transition of, like, bioinformatics to data science, but with, like, all the rise in AI and stuff like that. I was just interested, uh, you know, has your team found any interesting applications for LLM or other generative AI products recently? I'd love to hear about that. Not my team. Um, so I've, I've actually been to a couple of 
conferences slash workshops where people are, you know, throwing around this generative AI idea in the drug development space. And what I have found is that in general, there's a lot of hype and not a lot of results, um, specifically when you're talking about gen AI, right? Um, I also think that over time, what people call, what I would call just statistics and analysis has changed. So, you know, seven years ago, it was, what are we doing with machine learning? That's, you know, someone talking to me, right? And then, you know, five years ago, it's like, what are we doing with, you know, deep learning? And now it's like, what are we doing with AI? Um, I think that for the kinds of analyses we do, the technology is not there yet for that. Um, I think it's it's different in the chemistry space um, where you have a lot of data points going in and you have a lot of screens being run. So you have something that you can run on that you can generate these models on. When you're talking about like microbiome patient data in, in like a any kind of clinical trial, honestly, um, the sample sizes aren't large enough to build those kinds of models. And I don't think that people have a clear idea really of even what are the right questions to ask with those kinds of models. Um, that's my, sorry, it's kind of a downer, but that's my take on it right now. Um, you know, I was speaking to um, our co-founder a couple of weeks ago and he was he was laughing. He, he told me that, you know, he had spoken to this investor recently and she was like, yeah, you know, half of these companies that are touting their AI capabilities, like you can do what they do in Excel. It's it's not what you think it is. So funny. I, I appreciate that perspective. And though it's actually incredibly useful to get like the the you know the, the real kind of perspective. So thank you. Thank you. I think we have gotten to mo every question so far. Travis, you told me to put this one at the bottom of the priority list. So you get to go <laughs> right now. <laughs> Thanks. I was curious, um, you know, there's a lot of scuttle in the industry around how do we do FDA submissions and R only. Um, and, you know, for standard clinical trials, there's a lot of movement there. I'm grateful that other companies are kind of taking lead there. But what you at Rome do is is a step beyond, really. And hearing that you're using Python maybe makes it an extra step of challenging. Like validating Python environments comes to mind. I didn't know Kevin was here. He probably might also have commentary on, on this topic. But um yeah, what does that look like for you? Have you, had to, have you had to manage that? Like, how do you how do you validate and ensure that the FDA or other regulators believe in the in the novel bioinformatics pipeline that you're implementing? It's a really good question. We actually struggled with that quite a lot when I was at Ceres, and we were preparing our BLA filing. Um, and so, I mean, I don't think I have a really good answer for that. We we do the best we can to perform the kind of validation experiments that we think need to be done to validate those environments. I mean, Kevin may know better, you know, being from the FDA, but um, you know, we we captured all of our environment variables. We were using R at the time, so you know, there's a RM package, right? So we used that. We used all of the packages that we could to make sure that our environment was unpackable and reproducible um, by anyone. And that was really, I think at the time we were also considering like Docker images. Um, we were trying to, you know, we were wondering like what kind of data do we need to submit to the FDA? You probably don't want all of our FASTQ files, like our raw sequencing data. You probably don't care about that, but like at what level, what is the right level of data to, to submit? And we had a lot of internal struggles um, trying to define that as well. We recommend CBER. Sorry? Yeah, we recommend CBER, the Center for Biologics, I'm guessing. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you use biocompute objects? Are you familiar? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with what they are? Mm -mm. Okay. So it's a it's something that the FDA developed as a like a format for storing all of your parameters in your pipeline, you know, in a okay. file. So that's it's uh you can kind of send this file and it, and it, it it makes your code reusable, you know, or um okay yeah it makes makes things reproducible. Uh, I'm not I'm not I wasn't personally involved very much in it. It's a, it's been a Cber thing, you know, because they 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 dealt more with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, 
Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. I would I would like to connect with you actually after this to to talk about this more because we will have more of these kinds of issues coming up as uh, we're also moving into the clinic here at Rome. Okay. Well, yeah, and this I'm not fun. in. Could I, I, mean, could I be, be a fly able... in the wall too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's let's spin off the. One, the... I mean, yeah. <laughs> one nerdy question is: this, How did you deal with human contamination in the reference genomes? Because yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've run into that problem. <laughs> we, I mean, we do we do the double mapping. So first for the microbiome stuff, we map to the human reference genome first and remove all of that. Um, in some indications, it's like uh, much more critical than others. So we also had studies in ulcerative colitis and in the patient stool samples that were, um, you know, that had a lot of blood contamination, for example, you can see that 95% of your sequence is coming from human data. And well, and uh, the uh, did you ever stumble across the FDA Argus database? That was a project from CDRH where they're trying to make reference grade genomes for mm -hmm. basically clean, clean microbial genomes as references mm -hmm. available. Um, but it sounds like maybe, maybe not. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> I think I we're out of time. <laughs> I know we're a little bit over. It sounds like this is a really fun conversation for everybody to have. And I would love to listen to that too. Kevin, it sounds like we're needing a uh, FDA submissions chat as well. Yeah, I um, love that actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Leanne. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and, and sharing your experience. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.